Hey there, welcome back to Brad's Labs. Today we're going to be traveling back to the Middle Stone Age in Africa. Today's video is requested by Roland. They only had a couple simple requests. They wanted to go back to Paleolithic Africa. If you notice, I didn't say Paleolithic in the title. We're going to go more into that. Second thing they wanted was to be a 10 year old boy. So very simple. Let's just go ahead and get into it. So as I mentioned before, we're not going to be using the term Paleolithic. Simply enough, they don't use that in Africa. That's a European term. This was news to me. I didn't know this, so we both learned something today. In Europe, we use Paleolithic, and we break it down into three eras. You got the upper, middle, and lower. In Africa, they basically just took the literal translation from the word Paleolithic, which is actually from ancient Greece, which Paleos means old, Lithic from Lithos meaning stone. And in Africa, they literally just call it early, middle, and late Stone Age. Because they gave me such a large time frame to look at, you know, the Paleolithic or the Stone Age, it wasn't, you know, just a couple hundred years. It was thousands of years. And in Africa, we couldn't take and go to the early Stone Age because simply enough, they wanted to be Homo sapien and Homo sapiens hadn't rocked up on the scene yet. We didn't show up until about 300,000 years ago. And the early Stone Age started 3 million years ago and goes to about 300,000 years ago. So that helped narrow things down quite a bit for me. So I went with the Middle Stone Age, which started 300,000 years ago and went to around 35,000 years ago. And this was actually a time when we started to see a lot of development and technology that we actually still use today, surprisingly enough. Now this is the part of the video where I say Roland wants to be age X and they want to go back to year Y. So if you solve for W, you have your video. Unfortunately, it's not that easy. Now, if you're thinking, I came here for you to tell me a story, not for me to do your math homework, you have every right to be angry. So I'm gonna go ahead and take and tell you what the answer for P is. Simply enough, if you watch the last two videos we've done on radiocarbon dating and relative dating, well, then you'll understand we can't date objects back to more than 50,000 years with radiocarbon dating. And you're gonna go, okay, well, how do we get the dates for this? Well, I haven't done those videos yet, so you're gonna have to stay tuned for that. So we're going to go back to De Kluth Rock Shelter in South Africa. It dates back to about 60,000 years ago, and it actually is a very important place for the development of us as a species. So Roland gets into this time machine and he's sent back 60,000 years. And he arrives, he's a 10-year-old boy, he's in a hunter-gatherer group, and what would his life have been like? Well, in modern times, we tend to think of hunter-gatherers as being primitive, not as smart as we are. That's far from the truth. They were using all the latest technology that they had available to them at that time. They actually would have had quite a bit of downtime. We think of hunter-gatherers, we go, well, they constantly were moving. They constantly were having to survive. But just like us, they would have had times where surplus food was there and they would have had time to do other things. Roland's group would have followed the migrational patterns of the animals that they were hunting. And at this point in time, we catch them. They have a surplus of food. There's plenty of food growing and there's plenty of meat that they've already prepared. So children get bored, and when they get bored nowadays, we just throw them in front of a computer and say, shut up, leave me alone for 10 minutes, I've got to go do something else. And then you go cry in your bedroom. Back then, they didn't have that option. What did they have? Ostrich shells. They would have just thrown the kid in front of an ostrich shell. So Roland finds himself with a piece of flint, and he's carving on these ostrich shells. The lines that he's carving are all straight, parallel, you know, intersecting each other, but they're not going to be curved. And that's simply enough. If you ever taken a knife and you tried to take and carve a spiral into a piece of wood, well, the knife itself is gonna wanna take and go straight because that's just the easiest way to go about it. So on the ostrich shells, we find parallel lines to each other and some pretty intricate designs. When Roland wasn't playing on his ostrich shell, what was he doing? He was surviving. He would have helped gather. He would have done some small game hunts. At the site, there was around 40 different species of animals found. They ranged from deers to honey badgers, rhinoceroses, to they must have been truly crazy to go after this two to five ton killing machine called a hippopotamus. As I mentioned before, when he wasn't helping gather, he would help hunt, but you know, only small game, tortoises, hares, other small creatures like that, because he wasn't big enough to go on the big hunts. I mean, let's be honest, a 10 year old going up against a hippopotamus is the worst hunger games that I could ever imagine. And those odds would not be in his favor. <laughs> so how long would Roland have actually lived? Surprisingly quite a while. He might've lived all the way into his sixties or seventies. Hunter gatherers actually have a pretty good life expectancy. 
Now, this is to say that he's not killed by that as before mentioned killing machine. When it came time for Roland to find a partner, what would have happened? And simply enough, depending on the way his group and the group around them operated, it would mean that either he went off and lived with another group where he became part of their family, or another group would send a female over to his group so that they could take and, you know, start reproducing. This served two purposes. One, when you send somebody off to another group, you're creating a bond, you're creating a tie. So you're less likely to go to war with them. You're more likely to sit there and share resources. You're more likely to take and share knowledge because you want to see your family continue on. The second thing this did was it diversified the gene pool. Even back then, we knew that, you know, having an Alabama love life was not good. And you needed that diversity in the gene pool. So by going outside of your group, it actually helped us as a species continue on to where we are at today. At the beginning of the video, I gave Roland, as a child, credit for carving onto the ostrich shells. We can't say this is for certain. It may have been an adult. It may have been a child. But this is a problem that archaeology has. We tend to think that children don't exist. That is something that does desperately need to change. And in fairness, in recent years, a lot of archaeologists have actually started to sit there and question what role did children play in society as we were coming up, especially in hunter-gatherer societies. And a large part of this is due to the fact that when we find a child in, you know, burials, we don't tend to look at the child and say, what were they doing? We look at the child and go, why were they important enough to be buried here? Meaning, who were their parents? Or why were they buried with these objects? We don't often question what role did that child play? Unfortunately, this is something that still persists. And I think a lot of it boils down to the fact that as archeologists, we're adults. I've never met a 10 year old archeologist, partially because they haven't gone through the training for it yet, but you know, you could be that one. But we tend to look at everything through our own eyes as adults. And sometimes we need to take a step back and go, there were children, children exist. We see them around us today. We know how they act. And maybe just once in a while, we need to take a step back and look at things the way that a 34 year old man child would look at things. Why was Roland carving on the eggshells? Uh, it might have served two purposes. Think about children today. When we're trying to teach children motor skills, we'll give them a piece of paper, usually with some kind of design on it and some crowns and say, color within the lines. This is teaching them motor skills. This is teaching them patience, all these things that they actually need to develop so that they can become a functional member of society. Well, the ostrich shell might have served much the same purpose, teaching him how to be gentle with something. You know, ostrich shells are tough, but they're not unbreakable. And this would have taught him how to take and use the blade, how to be gentle on something, how to just function. The second option for it, simply enough, is kids are annoying. And sometimes you just need a break from them. So you tell them, go do something else. So he may have started carving on ostrich shells just so that his parents, you know, wouldn't be annoyed by him for five minutes. So with all this in mind, I want to thank you for watching. I want to thank the patrons. And I hope you guys do have a wonderful day and full of childlike wonderment.